Welcome to the second in our three-part lens class. This time we're going to dig a little deeper into terms, lens idiosyncrasies, and filters. Let's get started. Welcome back. I'm Larry Becker. This time, let's start by talking a little bit about autofocusing. If you have autofocus turned on, on your camera and on your lens, tiny motors will move lens components to focus for you automatically. But it doesn't always work because some lenses have focus motors built in and some don't. Some cameras have focus motors so that they can operate autofocus lenses that don't have their own onboard motors. But when you pair up a lens that doesn't have a focus motor with a camera that doesn't have a focus motor, you have to focus manually. If you're buying a kit with a camera body and lens, you shouldn't have any problems. But when you buy more lenses or a different camera body, just be aware that what you're buying may keep your lens and camera combo from autofocusing. There's another situation when lenses that appear to be compatible with a particular camera might not work the way that you would expect. This happens when a lens is specifically designed for a smaller sensor and you try to use it on a full frame camera. Now for this to make sense, you'll need to understand what sensor sizes are out there. This next explanation might seem confusing unless I make one quick distinction here. Now older SLR cameras that use the most popular film size were called 35 millimeter cameras. That 35 millimeter name is just talking about the physical size of the film. It has nothing to do with the lens. 35 millimeter cameras could have a 12 millimeter lens or a 35 or a 50 or even a 200 millimeter lens. These days, we refer to sensor sizes in terms of how they match up to the size of a traditional 35 millimeter camera negative. A camera with a sensor that's pretty much the same size as a 35 millimeter negative is said to be a full frame camera. Now keep in mind the physical size of a sensor has nothing to do with the megapixels. You can have a full frame sensor that's 12 megapixels or 20 or 36. And there are smaller sensors that are 12 or 16 or 24 megapixels. So full frame just refers to the physical dimensions, not the resolution. When it comes to just about every DSLR on the market today, there are almost always equipped with a full frame sensor or a somewhat smaller sensor called an APS-C size sensor. Besides DSLRs, there are quite a few smaller sensor sizes like in point and shoot cameras, but we're just talking about DSLRs and their lenses. Here are a few graphics designed to show you how cropped sensors behave with certain lenses. For this example, let's say we have a 50 millimeter lens. Now, imagine this is what your lens sees. This is how that light would land on a full frame sensor. APS-C sensors are smaller, so that same light on a smaller sensor would give you a cropped image that covers approximately this area. Now look at that image and consider this. The cropped image area of the smaller rectangle is essentially the field of view that you would get on your full frame sensor if you zoomed in. The amount of simulated zoom is called crop factor, so people can estimate the field of view that they can expect from a particular lens. Canon's APS-C crop factor is 1.6x. Sony's and Nikon's crop factor for their APS-C sensors is 1.5x, so they're all pretty darn close to one another. Once you know what the crop factor is, you can calculate what your field of view will be like with a particular lens by multiplying the lens number by the crop factor. Here's what I mean. A 50 millimeter Nikon lens on a full frame sensor gives you the field of view of a 50 millimeter lens. But that exact same lens on a cropped sensor Nikon gives you the field of view that a 75 millimeter lens would on a full frame camera. That's what's often called a 35 millimeter equivalent focal length. Now, it may seem like we got off on a tangent talking about camera sensor size in a lens class, but you need to understand it so that crop factor makes sense and 
because this is the same reason that some lenses which were designed for a cropped sensor simply won't work well on a full frame camera. That's because they may be just fine capturing and focusing light to capture a smaller image area, but they just can't light up the entire image area of a full frame sensor. If you do mount a lens designed for a cropped sensor camera onto a full frame camera, one of two things is going to happen. If your full frame camera has a setting in it to compensate for these lenses, it will crop the image in camera automatically. The other possibility is that you'll get good image information in the middle of your picture area, but you'll pretty much see darkness around the entire outside edge of your pictures. And remember, this is just a one-way problem. As you've seen, lenses that are intended for full-frame sensors have no problem giving cropped sensor cameras everything they need to capture a good image from edge to edge. Now it's time for me to throw some more important terms at you. First up, vignetting. That's when the light values around the outside of your image area are darker or lighter than the center of your image area. Usually it's darker. The optics of more expensive lenses minimize or eliminate these issues, but you might see this with some images you shoot. With vignetting, and with most of the lens issues we'll be discussing here, you can usually compensate for it or fully repair the issues with a click or two in post-processing. There are even cameras with embedded software that fix all known lens anomalies right there in camera. Besides that, there are lens profiles for post-processing applications like Lightroom, Camera Raw, and Apple Aperture, which repair known lens issues. Our next term also describes a problem, and that's chromatic aberration. This is a color problem that results in halos of various unwanted colors appearing in your image. It's usually more noticeable around the outside of your image area and where there are high contrast edges rather than with smooth objects. This problem comes from the way that the light spectrum travels through all of your lens elements and it's usually most pronounced with less expensive lenses. A little in-camera JPEG processing or post-processing with raw images will knock it right out or at least minimize it. The term barrel distortion in simplest terms is when lines that you know should be straight look bent or warped because of the field of view of your lens. For example, wide-angle lenses and fisheye lenses can give images that warped and distorted look in order to fit lots of information into your final image. This isn't necessarily a bad thing depending on what kind of image you're trying to capture, but there are a couple of things that you should know. First, a focal length of around 50 millimeters is roughly the regular human perspective. Things in an image taken with a 50 millimeter lens won't be distorted or magnified. When you go to higher numbers like 100 millimeters or 200 millimeters or more, the details in your image will be magnified. When you go to focal lengths like 24 millimeters or 18 or 12 millimeters, you'll be gathering image information from a wider area than normal human vision, so things may appear bloated or distorted. In fact, one of the things I tell new photographers using a zoom lens for portraits is that they'll get better results if they step back and zoom in. Headshots of people taken with wide-angle lenses make them look larger than they really are. Oh, and zooming in more than 50 millimeters will not usually distort your images. It'll just bring you closer to your subject. For example, here's a headshot with a wide-angle lens. See how distorted the facial features are? And here's the same headshot when we stepped back and zoomed in. See how it kind of normalizes the facial features? Now let's talk about lens coatings. All lenses have coated surfaces throughout the lens to minimize reflection and maximize light transmitted through each lens element. Lately, there have been some special new coatings invented called nano coatings that do an even better job of reducing glare. You'll find that some of the more expensive, higher quality lenses have nano coatings, and this can make a difference with glare reduction. But even though all lenses have some sort of coatings throughout, not all filters do. In photography, a filter is a piece of glass or plastic you usually screw onto the front of your lens, which modifies the light coming into the lens. Better quality filters are glass, 
as opposed to plastic. And you should know that some of the less expensive filters, even glass ones, may have no coatings on them at all. So be aware that if you have a great lens and you put a simple UV filter on it, because you've heard that that's a good idea to protect your front lens element with a UV filter, you could be slightly degrading the quality of your lens. I've seen some of the most spirited exchanges in photography forums on the topic of filters. Photographers seem to have very strong opinions about them, and rather than give you my opinions of the good ones and the bad ones, I'll leave that to the photo gear counselors at B&H, and I'll tell you what's out there so that you at least have a starting point. As I mentioned, there are UV filters that are usually clear and they block some of the UV spectrum. Neutral density filters, we call them ND filters for short, are kind of like adding gray sunglasses to your camera. They just cut light coming in. Some have a gradient to compensate for a bright sky. And then there are others that just darken the scene uniformly. There are kits with different amounts of gray, kits that allow for ND filter stacking, and there are even variable ND filters that allow you to dial in a value of light reduction. One of the primary uses for ND filters is for photographing running water during the day so that you can shoot a timed exposure. That way, water looks silky, but there's not an abundance of light coming in which would overexpose your image. The other common filter is a polarizing filter. It cuts glare and it minimizes atmospheric haze. So in broad daylight, you'll be able to get richer blue skies and better colors throughout your image. In our third and final video in this three-part lens overview, we'll cover a few specialty lens types, teleconverters, lens care and maintenance, and more. Until then, for B&H and Kelby Training, I'm Larry Becker. Thanks for watching. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help. Scott Kelby here and welcome to this quick tour of our online training. We have hundreds of online classes for you covering everything from lighting to landscape photography. From portrait photography to sports, we have classes on wedding, automotive photography, shooting, food, fashion, travel, you name it. The most incredible part of this is the price. You get all of this for just $199 a year or you can pay monthly for just $24.95. 24 hour a day, 7 day a week access from anywhere in the world. I invite you to join with us today and start learning right now.